All right, folks, so this is 24-6. This is the end of the chapter, so let's get this done. So we're going to be talking about the small intestine, the accessory organs that dump their contents into the small intestine, and then the large intestine and the defecation reflex. All right, so let's go here. So this is really anatomy right here. You, uh, we learned the duodenum, du duodenum. I say duodenum, but correctly, it's duodenum. Jejunum and ileum. Uh, we learn those in lab. But let me just tell you that the folds inside the small intestine right here, these are called plica circularis, uh, circular folds. Plica circularis. Same thing as before, increased surface area. All right, so you can see that. Okay, they have folds on the folds. They have villi. But there is something new I'm going to be showing you this time. And that is on the villi, the simple columnar epithelium have microvilli. So you'll see that right here very shortly. But first of all, you can see the tunics. You can see the serosa. You can see the muscularis externa. You can see the submucosa. You can see the muscularis mucosa. You can see the lamina propria of the mucosa, and then you can see the villi of the mucosa. And of course, these villi exist on these folds. So you got you got finger-like projections on the folds, and then I'm going to even get smaller and show you microvilli shortly. Okay, here we go. You can barely see them right here. So here's a villi. Look at this villi with the um, artery coming in, the capillary beds, and the vein going out. All right. Look at this lacteal right up through the villi. Why do we care about that lacteal? Well, that's where the lipids go. Lipids are absorbed into the lacteals first and then come back to the bloodstream and the liver. Whereas everything else is absorbed into the capillaries, the blood capillaries. So all your nutrients are absorbed into the blood capillaries except for the lipids and the lipids go into the lacteals. Look at these Look at these little hair-like projections on the simple columnar epithelium right there. Those are microvilli. So the villi are composed of simple columnar epithelium, which have microvilli. And you have these goblet cells right here secreting mucus as well. So this is indeed a mucous membrane, as we've said before. Uh, scattered throughout the the gastrointestinal tract there's these lymph nodes and lymph nodules they're called um generally they're called malt mucosa associated lymph tissue typically the malt located in the alimentary tract is called galt gut associated lymph tissue so um, scattered throughout, we have these malts or these galts or lymphoid nodules scattered throughout the digestive tract. This is just a histological picture of it. You can see the mucus cells. You can see the capillaries. You can see the lacteal. We're going to look at this in lab. All right. Now what we have here is the pancreas with endocrine, of course, and exocrine function. We've talked about the endocrine function in detail. The exocrine function is this. The pancreas makes enzymes and bicarb. Enzymes and bicarbonate. The bicarbonate secreted into the duodenum and it neutralizes. It neutralizes the, uh, the acids from the stomach because the enzymes need a basic environment to be functional. So here's the pancreatic duct right here. Right here's the pancreatic duct carrying the bicarb and the enzymes. Here's the accessory pancreatic duct going up to the minor papilla. Here's the pancreatic duct continuing going to the major papilla. There's a minor papilla and major papilla. Now here's the common bile duct. That joins the pancreatic duct right here. And so the common bile duct uses the major duodenal papilla in some of us. Some of us, it actually doesn't join, and it has its own ent entry into the duodenum. But most of us, most of us, it joins. So we teach, we always teach the anatomy that's the most common anatomy. It's not, be it's not because it's the only anatomy out there. So you can see that. All right, the liver, the liver makes bile. And the liver stores the bile in the gallbladder. 
So the bile is stored in the gallbladder where it's concentrated. The bile is made by the liver. I typically test that to make sure you understand the bile is made by the liver but stored in the gallbladder. This is what the liver looks like. It has these hexagonal, uh, um, oh, what do you want to call them? These hexagonal structures. That's what the uh, that's how the liver looks. And you have these triads here, where you have a, a bile duct, a portal vein, and an artery. So you have these um, portal triads. That's what it's over oh, right here. Portal triad where you have a portal vein, an artery, and a bile duct. These capillaries in here are, are uh, sinusoidal capillaries. Remember you learned three capillaries before. You learned continuous capillaries. You learned fenestrated capillaries. And you learned sinusoidal capillaries. The capillaries in the liver are sinusoidal. That means big gaping holes in them. Things can pass quite easily in and out of the blood. We have macrophages, fixed macrophages in the liver called Kupfer cells. Those are fixed macrophages. They stay in the liver. They don't float around. All right, so that's the liver. Here's the gallbladder storing the bile. So this is anatomy, but you can see that we have a right hepatic duct and a left hepatic duct. That comes together to make the common hepatic duct. The common hepatic duct joins the cystic duct to make the common bile duct. The common bile duct goes down and dumps its bile via the major duodenal papilla. The common bile duct actually joins the, the pancreatic duct, and they have one opening into the duodenum. So you can see that. And again, we'll learn that in lab. I'm, I'm telling you some lab stuff just so I can talk to it. This is showing you the major duodenal papilla. It's showing you the common bile duct joining the pancreatic duct right here. It's showing you that. This is called the hepatopancreatic sphincter. Uh, sphincter of Odie, I think. You guys can look that up. I think it's called the sphincter of Odie. But we're getting rid of eponyms these days. So I could be wrong on that sphincter of Odie. I don't remember anymore. But we call it the hepatopancreatic sphincter. This sphincter, of course, can control the uh, release of pancreatic juices into the duodenum and the release of bile into the duodenum. And, of course, as you can imagine, the sphincter is under control of hormones and uh, some local reflexes and some long reflexes. This is a collage showing you both. All right, so who controls the release of this bile and this pancreatic juices? Well, hormones do. Cholecystokinin does. So why is cholecystokinin, why is that released? Well, when you have lipids in your duodenum, and that's detected by receptors in your duodenum, and the, the duodenum releases cholecystokinin. All right. The cholecystokinin goes up to the gallbladder and tells it to contract. The gallbladder is surrounded by smooth muscles. The gallbladder contracts and the bile comes down through. Well, remember, there's that hepatopancreatic sphincter right there. So, I mean, I don't care if the gallbladder is contracting or not. What's going on with the hepatopancreatic sphincter? What happens is CCK relaxes that hepatopancreatic sphincter. So not only does it cause the gallbladder to contract, but it also causes the hepatopancreatic sphincter to relax, and then bile enters the small intestine. What does bile do? It emulsifies fat. Now that doesn't mean it chemically digests it, because it doesn't. Lipase chemically digests fat. But what the bile does is it breaks a big fat droplet up into small fat droplets, and that's emulsification. So bile emulsifies fat. When you have your gallbladder removed, you can still get bile in your du into your duodenum, but not in great quantities. It kind of just trickles down through from the liver. And you have a hard time eating fatty meals because you don't emulsify fat much. If you don't emulsify fat, you won't be able to digest it as, as efficiently. That could lead to uh, steatorrhea. Fatty diarrhea 
you can, and we can do a fecal fat analysis to see if this is occurring. That's actually a test the lab does called fecal fat. All right, so that's the release of bile, cholecystokinin. All right, what does the liver do for us? The liver does a ton of stuff for us, by the way. Uh, composition of circulating blood. The liver makes most of the proteins in the plasma. There's a couple it doesn't make. It doesn't make von Willebrand's factor. It doesn't make... Boy, the liver makes most of those proteins. Oh, it doesn't make the antibodies. B cells make the antibodies. But why the liver makes most of those proteins. So the liver makes most of the proteins in your plasma. The liver does nutrient metabolism. The liver detoxifies and removes waste. It actually removes the waste from old, broken red blood cells and uses some of that waste to make bile, in fact. Uh, the liver stores some nutrients. It actually stores vitamin B12. Most, usually the rule of thumb is water-soluble vitamins aren't stored appreciably, but the B12 is the exception. The liver does store B12. liver has a lot of glycogen, so the liver stores nutrients. This drug inactivation, the detoxification, is, is, is done by a cytochrome P450 system. That's what it's called, cytochrome P450. Really cool detoxification system in the liver. The liver cells have extensive smooth ER with cytochrome P450s that detoxify drugs. Uh, the, liver, the liver gets 25% of the cardiac output. CO stands for cardiac output. All right. The liver contains those cut for cells, which are fixed macrophages. Uh, they do a lot of phagocytosis for us. They even do antigen presentation for us. Now, I, don't, I know you don't know what that means yet, unless you remember Bio203. Well, you probably sh you should remember what that means. So there's antigen-presenting antigen cells in the liver. The liver synthesizes most of our plasma pr proteins. Um, the liver is involved in removal of hormones, removal of antibodies, and especially antibody-antigen complexes. And uh, it synthesizes bile. Okay, so the liver does a whole bunch of things for us. All right, so what controls the liver? Well, what we can see here is this. We have the duodenum making cholecystokinin. We already said that cholecystokinin goes up and tells the gallbladder, give me your bile, and it does that. Of, so right here, cholecystokinin goes to the gallbladder and stimulates contraction. All right. Um, look at right here. Secretin causes the secretion. So it stimulates bile secretion by the liver. Well, where does it go? Gallbladder. It can be it can be stored in the gallbladder, and actually, it shows you that here, right here. If you're not opening the sphincter yet, where does the bile go that's being secreted? Right into the gallbladder. See that arrow? And then when when you do release CCK, let's say you get secretin released before CCK. No problem, store the gallbladder in the bile. When you finally do release CCK, contract the gallbladder, open the sphincter, hepatopancreatic sphincter, and get rid of all of that. So the secretin causes secretion of, of bile from the liver. All right, bile salts emulsify fat. So these are the major hormones of the duodenum. We're actually just revisiting them. Or, you know, actually some of them might be new to you, but we're revisiting most of these. Uh, gastrin causes gastric motility, increases gastric motility. That means stomach churning. It also increases secretion, gastric secretion, which means your parietal and chief cells. All right. Secretin. Secretin released by the duodenum goes up to the liver and says secrete bile. And that can be stored in the gallbladder if CCK is not secreted. Or if CCK, CCK is already secreted and opens that hepatopancreatic sphincter, that bile can go right down into the duodenum. Gastric inhibitory peptide. This is secreted when we have fats or carbohydrates in our duodenum. Remember that? We, we already talked about that a little bit. This is part of the enterogastric reflex and it inhibits gastric activity. It decreases the activity of your stomach. So that's the, that's the GIP or the gastric inhibitory peptide. Cholecystokinin, we already talked about. The cholecystokinin tells the gallbladder to contract and bile goes down into your duodenum 
and that bile emulsifies the fat. The CCK also relaxes the hepatopancreatic sphincter. Now, this is a new one for you, the vasoactive intestinal peptide. This is also secreted by intestinal glands. Think about this. There is no sense in doing all this digestion if you're not going to absorb the nutrients. Well, where do the nutrients go? With the exception of lipids, which go into the lymph vessels, the nutrients go into your capillaries inside these villi. Well, you better send some more blood flow to the intestine if you're going to do all this digestion. No problem, we do. Vasoactive intestinal peptide is a hormone made and secreted by intestinal glands that cause the dilation of the capillaries in the intestine and increase blood flow to the area. So the VIP increases the blood flow to the area and you can, in fact, absorb all those nutrients that you just digested. All right, there's another hormone called enterocrinin. This increases mucus production. It's, re it's released by the duodenum and it stimulates mucus production by the submucosal glands. And this is the collage telling you what they all do. All right, so these are all hormones. These are all made by enteroendocrine cells. These are all involved in hormonal reflexes in the intestine. And this is a picture showing you the same darn thing. So this tells you what everything does. I, I personally like the picture better. Uh, just look at the key so you're understanding. Red arrow stimulates. Blue arrow with double line inhibits. You can see that GIP inhibits gastrin. You can see that. You can see we have a dotted red line. And that dotted red line doesn't necessarily mean stimulates, but it means facilitation. So you can see that insulin and insulin from the pancreas facilitates nutrient utilization. And we've already talked about that in Chapter 18. All right. So that's the enteroendocrine functions.